Okay, hello everyone. I guess we'd better start. Uh, first off, uh, thanks to the four of you who joined the video meeting with Birmingham. I have to admit I was a little bit disappointed with the turnout. We had like one guy from Birmingham, right? And so, and this person as well, he was a little bit, you know, pumi. Seemed like he didn't really know what he was there for. So uh, I, I don't particularly have a very good feeling about this. But anyway, for the four of you who turned up, thank you very much. So I think the, um, the, the, the feeling I get from this meeting is that they, they don't really have very many students who are interested in like doing a year in France in biology. And that means we probably won't be able to get more places in the future for going there. Okay, so at the moment we have like two places for the whole of the science faculty on uh, study mobility. And I think it will probably stay like that. Okay, so for next year, there will be like two places in Birmingham. And that's for like the whole of the faculty and between the different disciplines, we have to decide how we're going to allocate those two places between biology, physics, uh, chemistry, and so on. Um, so that means probably there'll only be one person able to go from biology. Hello. Uh, okay. So that's it. Now we have the last two lectures from me this week on, well, viruses and bacteriophage. So what I think, and we also have to finish off microbe of the week. So I'll send out a microbe of the week question this evening, 7 p.m. Okay. And that means the uh, final results are going to be on Wednesday. Okay, because that's our last lecture. So, microbe of the week. Oh, I don't know. Let's see where the scores are as well, since I'm thinking about it. Oh, I don't have it. Where is it? lost the file. God damn it. Let me see. Okay, so here's how the scores stand. There's like maybe four people here who are like really sending in good answers every week. So uh, probably between these four. Okay. So. <laughs> That's it. So that's where we are. Okay, so let's start on viruses and bacteriophage. So there's basically two lectures and there's three parts. So we start out with a general introduction. What are viruses and why are they different from bacteria? And then a little bit about some technical approaches, how to study viruses, and then uh, the basics of virus structure. So this is general for all viruses infecting any type of organism. And then afterwards, we go on to bacteriophage, lytic and lysogenic uh, replication cycles, how bacteriophage, that is viruses that infect bacteria, impact human health. And then the last part is human viral infections. So what uh, is going to probably happen is I'll probably get to about halfway through the second part today, and we finish up all the rest on Wednesday.
The first thing is, you know, what exactly are viruses? So they are infectious particles, some kind of uh, part of the living world that infects other organisms. And in the 19th century, when the first viral infections were studied, there wasn't really <coughs> any way to characterize viruses. The only thing that was known that was that it was impossible to culture them on a simple culture medium. So for, well, I don't know, like a cholera, you can uh, culture the bacteria on a culture medium, grow them, purify them, and use them to infect some other kind of animal and validate Cox postulates. But for a viral infection, you could, it was impossible to grow them in the 19th century. So that's all that uh, you know, people like Pasteur were able to say. You know, when Pasteur worked on uh, rabies, he was able to propagate the infection from one animal to another, but it was impossible to take the material from an infected animal and grow it on some culture medium. Now, the first indication of what viruses were like, their physical nature, came from uh, Bajoink in the beginning of the 20th century, who was working on the infect an infection of tobacco plants, which caused a mosaic type pattern on leaves. And the infectious agent that was responsible for this disease in plants could pass through the pores of a filter. And one of these porcelain filters, a Chamberlain fil filter, was known to be able to retain all types of bacteria. So this was the first indication that viruses are really different from bacteria because they could pass through the pores of a porcelain filter. And that was the, the really the first working definition of a virus a filterable infectious agent. Whereas, and that was kind of useful because it gave scientists or, or microbiologists a way to differentiate between bacteria and viruses. Now, uh, that was kind of okay. And people began to work on and, and understand that certain infections were caused by viruses and accumulated a certain amount of information about the nature of these infectious agents. And in particular, most of the fundamental work was done on bacteriophages. And then by the 1950s, they become, well, this was, this was really the beginning of molecular biology. So it was possible to, to, to give a kind of description of what viruses are, bringing together all of the, what at that time was new information on the molecular biology and the biochemistry of virus particles. So this was what André Le Voff did in uh, 1957. He gave these following characteristics of viruses. So he started out with size. The infectious particle of a virus has, le has, has a diameter less than 250 nanometers. So that's kind of related to this original definition here. Because they're so small, they pass through the filter. One thing that uh, Levov and other people have noticed is that when you purify virus particles, you can determine that they're basically made up of protein and nucleic acid, possibly with a lipid envelope. But the nucleic acid part is either RNA or DNA, but not both. Whereas any type of cell, and that's also true for bacterial endospores that aren't metabolically active. Any type of cell has got a genome made out of DNA and three types of RNA, ribosomal, transfer, and messenger RNA. When you get a virus particle, generally speaking, you only get RNA or DNA. So this is also telling you that sometimes the genome of a virus can be RNA, not DNA. So that's something about the biochemical characteristics of virus particles. And then this is the, these three other characteristics are related to their biology. So all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They are entirely dependent on a host cell for their replication. And that's because they don't code for the enzymes 
required to produce metabolic energy or proteins. And another thing that, uh, had been, that people had begun to realize by that time was that viruses don't actually divide like cells. They don't replicate by binary division. They have a different process for, for replication. Now, the other thing that we, we could add to this is that uh, when you look in the genome of a virus, no viruses have been found to code for their own ribosomal RNA. And that's really a big fundamental difference between viral and cellular genomes, because ribosomal RNA is practically the most conserved molecule in the whole of the rest of the living world. So the fact that virus genomes don't have this really sets them apart from every type of cell. And this is such a fundamental difference that uh, there's a microbiologist at the Pasteur Institute, Patrick Forter, who has proposed that the history of life is just a, you know, a several billion year struggle between two different kinds of replicators. Okay, there's the replicators with ribosomes that produce their own proteins, their cells, and there's the replicators without ribosomes, those are the viruses. And that, uh, you know, ever since the ribosomes have evolved, there's been this fundamental kind of bifurcation in you know, the history of life. Okay, so these were the um, characteristics proposed by André Levoff in, in 1957. And not all of them are 100% true for all viruses. So let, let's have a look at them one by one, okay? So for this size characteristic, now, uh, at the time Levoff uh, was writing, basically all known viruses uh, respected his size limit. The biggest virus that was known were pox viruses. And here, these are all like electron micrographs, and I've tried to show them to scale. So this bar here is 200 nanometers. This bar here is 100 nanometers. And you can see that this pox virus particle is just under the size limit is just about 250 nanometers in diameter. So at that time, this was true for all viruses and all bacteria were bigger than this. However, uh, so there are also living or biological objects like this. And this bar here is 100 nanometers. So this thing is, uh, has got a diameter less than 200 nanometers. It's got a pretty simple looking structure, but in fact, this is a bacterium. It's not a virus. This is a mycoplasma, one of the bacteria that doesn't have a peptidoglycan cell wall. So some of the smallest, simplest bacteria really are about the same size as the biggest viruses. And also in the last 20 years or so, there have been families of giant viruses that have been discovered with particle sizes that are about, you know, 500 nanometers to one micron in size. So the biggest viruses are bigger than the smallest bacteria. So this, this part of the Levoff definition is not 100% true. There's some kind of overlap at the extremes of the viral and bacterial world. Obligatory intracellular parasites. That is true of all viruses, but it's also true for some bacteria. There are some bacteria that cannot grow on just a simple culture medium. They only grow inside cells. So this is true for Mycobacterium leprae, the causative agent of leprosy, and also the Chlamydia and Rickettsia. They only grow inside a cellular host. Now, so, you know, this is a true statement for all viruses, but it's not sufficient to distinguish all viruses from all bacteria. Now, what does distinguish viruses from bacteria is that viruses are not generating their own energy or synthesizing their own proteins. So all, interest, all bacteria, including intracellular bacteria, produce their own proteins because they have their own ribosomes. And most of them also generate their own ATP. Okay, there is one exception. So chlamydia don't generate their own ATP. They actually import ATP from the host cell cytoplasm and they export ADP. So it's kind of like a mitochondrion, but in reverse. 
Okay, so mitochondria, they import ADP, right? And they export ATP. So chlamydia do the opposite. But generally speaking, you know, all bacteria, including intracellular bacteria, are kind of independent for their energy and protein metabolism. Now, the last point was the absence of binary division in viruses. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, all cells, as they grow and divide, they start with one cell getting a bit bigger, and then this cell will kind of bud off and break into two daughter cells. Now, you could imagine that if viruses were to do the same thing, you would get a virus particle, it would grow bigger and bigger inside the cell, and then split in two, and then finally you have two progeny viruses. Now, in fact, this is not what happens. So what happens during virus replication for every virus, and this is true even for the giant viruses, is that at some point after infection of a cell, the virus genome is released. Okay, so you don't have a virus particle that exists anymore. You just have an infected cell. And this virus genome will direct the expression of viral proteins. And then when the infected cell has accumulated a lot of genome copies and a lot of virus proteins, then they're assembled together. It's like putting together a piece of furniture from Ikea or something like that, okay? So the, the, the genome's got the instructions on how to make the components and then the components all fit together to produce a new virus. So this way of producing an infectious particle is really more like the way a cell would produce a multi-molecular assembly, like a ribosome or some other multi-protein complex. And that's something that really sets viruses apart from cells, okay? So in the in, uh, at some point in the replication of all viruses, the virus itself you know, ceases to exist, or the virus particle. Okay, so those are the characteristics of viruses. The other thing that, well, should always be remembered about viruses is that they are everywhere. You know, medical virologists are only interested generally in viruses that infect humans and maybe some animal viruses that can be passed to us. But of course, you know, if you look, then you'll find that there are a whole bunch of viruses that infect vertebrates. Uh, a lot of viruses that infect plants, viruses that infect bacteria, and of course, viruses that will infect invertebrates. So as far as I know, there's no type of life form that doesn't have viruses. And if there is some kind of organism where we haven't described a virus, it's because nobody's looked yet. So every type of organism can be infected by viruses. Okay, so we know they exist, how do we study them? And there are a couple of problems. One of them is that they're too small to be observed by like microscopy. So you can't really see a virus particle. And uh, the other problem is that because they only replicate inside living organisms, it's difficult to grow them. So in order to study viruses, the first thing you need is some system to produce them. And then once you've produced or got the virus to replicate in a living system, you have to be able to purify the virus particles. Then once you've done that, then you can analyze what exactly is a virus particle by physico-chemical techniques. And then also, once you've got purified virus particles, you can use them to infect other cells or other organisms in a controlled way, because you know how many virus particles you've got, you can infect animals or cells with a known dose, and then analyze how the infection progresses. This is what I mean by this part, analysis in situ. You're not looking at a purified virus, you're looking at how the virus interacts with the host organism. And then what you want to do is uh, determine uh, when and which virus proteins are expressed by immunochemistry, so detecting specific virus proteins by antibodies, 
and you might also want to determine which virus messenger RNAs are expressed and how many genome copies you get with molecular biology techniques. So the first thing you need is a system for producing viruses, growing them. Now the first ones that we used were whole organisms. You could get some kind of infected animal or plant, take the tissue that showed symptoms, grind it up, and then somehow inoculate it into a new organism. So this is what uh, Pasteur did with the rabies virus. Just passage the virus from one animal to another. And it's also how the first plant viruses were studied. So the leaves that showed symptoms were ground up and then just uh, uh, kind of inoculated into other plants to show that there was a transmissible infectious agent. Now, that's kind of okay. It's still useful in some respects, still useful, but uh, it's not so easy to study exactly what's going on during an infection because the whole system is too complicated. You've got a whole organism and you've got just a raw extract from infected organisms. You need a simpler system to study it you know, in a, in a in a way that, let's say, in a, in a, in terms of biochemistry and molecular biology. So to simplify the system, you need to have cell culture. So you've only got one type of cell that's getting infected. Now, of course, the first system where this was possible was for bacteriophage. That is, bacteria. Uh, that is, viruses that infect bacteria. And these were first grown in, oh, well, the beginning or slightly more than 100 years ago. Now, that's why most of the fundamental uh, work on viruses was first done in bacteriophage, because there was no simple system for growing and studying animal viruses. And that changed really with the invention of cell culture and the uh, development of the first immortalized cell lines. So this meant that it was possible to grow viruses in a simpler system. So for example, the polio virus was the first virus for which a vaccine was produced in a cell culture system. Okay, so you get your virus, you infect some kind of production system, and then you want to purify the virus. So what you'll do is get some cells, infect them, leave them till you see that the cells have, have a, developed a cytopathic effect, harvest all the cells or maybe the supernatant. And what you want to do is purify the virus particles away from all the bits of uh, cell debris and soluble proteins. So the first thing you might do is filter the extract because you know the virus particles will pass through the filter. So you retain any kind of large fragments. And then you'll still have a mixture of virus particles and soluble proteins. And really the, the classical way to purify viruses ever since the 1960s has been to use ultracentrifugation over a gradient of, well, some kind of chemical that produces that, has a, that goes into solution and gives you a solution with a density higher than water. So this can be sucrose, cesium chloride, or this molecule called eodixanol. And what you do is you layer different concentrations of sucrose, eodixanol, or cesium chloride in a tube. So you have a high concentration at the base and a low concentration up here. So the density in grams per milliliter will be something like 1.4, 1.5 down here, and one gram per ml up here. Then you put your extract on the top, put it in the ultracentrifuge, and leave it until all the particles get pulled through this density gradient, and they'll form a kind of ring here, or a band, 
at one particular point in the, in the gradient where the density of the particle is equal to the density of the solution here. So this is one that I did and all the proteins are labeled with a fluorescent marker. So you have like all the soluble proteins up here and you have these two bands where you've got virus particles. And this one at the lower band will have DNA inside. Okay, because the particles are the same size, right? This one has got just protein and this one's got DNA inside. So the mass is higher for the same volume. So the density is greater. So these would be the infectious particles down there. So once you've got your purified particles, you can harvest this band and you can look at them by electron microscopy. So you can see that I've got these uh, homogeneous kind of small particles, only about 40 to 50 nanometers diameter. And then you can see how many different proteins there are with a SDS page. Okay, so you can do this with all sorts of different viruses and get a good characterization of what exactly a virus particle looks like and what are the molecular constituents that you have inside a virus particle. So that leads us to the basics of structures of virus particles, also called a virion. Now, come back. So the simplest types of viruses are what are called non-enveloped or naked viruses. And they are composed of nucleic acid in the middle, just surrounded by a capsid formed of one or several proteins. And there are two basic types of particle morphology. Uh, you have virus particles that are kind of like a stick shaped. So these have helical symmetry. And there are virus particles that are roughly spherical, which have icosahedral symmetry. And then bacteriophage, they're kind of, or the tail bacteriophage, they're composed of like one icosahedral head and a helical tail stuck together. Now these images are all taken by electron microscopy. Now, other types of viruses are called enveloped. So they have basically a nuclear capsid in the middle. So it's the same thing as what you have here. Genome in the middle, then a protein capsid, and then an envelope on the outside. So the envelope is a lipid bilayer derived from a cell membrane. And you have like simple envelope particles. So this is a kind of, you can see this is a kind of like elongated structure. On the inside, you've got a kind of capsid like this, and then an envelope on the outside. And you've also got some viruses that have well, many viruses that have uh, an icosahedral nucleocapsid and an envelope on the outside. Complex envelope viruses, well, that's uh, pox viruses, for example. They've got a complex structure. What you see on the inside doesn't really correspond to one of, of these two simple morphologies. Now, electron microscopy was invented, I think, at the end of the 1930s, and they were the first images of viruses taken in the 1940s. And this was really an important tool for the development of virology, because it's the only way you can actually visualize virus particles. And uh, so many virus families were first you know, named because of their distinctive morphology in electron microscopy. So arena viruses, they've got a kind of granular um, texture inside the particle. Uh, coronaviruses, they have a kind of crown around the outside of the virus particle. Kelisi viridae looks like a kind of cup on the outside of the virus particle. So electron microscopy and virus morphology, very important to name virus families. Okay, just a little bit about these two types of capsid morphology, helical and icosahedral symmetry. So 
The basic function of the capsid, the capsid proteins, is to protect the nucleic acid, okay? Because at some point in the virus life cycle, the virus has got to leave an infected cell and go and infect another cell. And a DNA or an RNA molecule just on its own outside the cell is not going to last very long. Chemically and enzymatically, it will be destroyed. So in order to be able to transmit from one infected cell to the next, the virus has got to get some way to protect its genome. And that's basically the function of the, the capsid. So the idea of the capsids with helical symmetry is that, okay, the nucleic acid is a long linear polymer, right? So what I can do to protect this linear molecule is get subunits of a protein that will form a kind of ring and then form rings around this long linear molecule to give a kind of helix like this. And then all of my DNA or RNA will be covered with protein and it will be protected. And that's basically what is happening here. So uh, certainly for the tobacco mosaic virus, which was the, you know, one of the first ones to be studied, you've got an RNA genome and it's associated with thousands of copies of a single capsid protein. And the mature virus particles look like this. You've got the kind of very long filament, RNA on the inside and protein on the outside. Now this kind of architecture is very, very frequent in plant viruses. There are a lot of different plant viruses which are non-enveloped with helical symmetry. Now in animal viruses, there are viruses that have helical capsids, helical nucleocapsids, but they are all enveloped, okay? There's no naked helical viruses that infect animals. So for example, this one here, you can see you've got like an elongated particle. It's covered with an envelope. Anybody know what this is? It's very nasty. Don't want to catch it. If you catch it, it's a toying cost whether you live or die. No, good guess though, good guess. Because rabies is also one of these with the helical capsid, but it's, it's not. This is kind of like more elongated. This is Ebola virus, Ebola hemorrhagic fever virus. And this one is measles virus here. So you've got a kind of, the actual particle is kind of spherical, but inside you've got a kind of big ball of filaments that are wound up inside. So the nucleocapsid is filamentous, helical symmetry, but kind of wrapped up into a ball. So this idea of wrapping up the filament that contains the nucleic acid into a ball is also the concept behind icosahedral capsids. So the idea here is, okay, we've got our nucleic acid, but it doesn't have to be like stretched out in uh, two dimensions like this. What you can do is you can roll up the nucleic acid into a ball, like a ball of, uh, uh, of wool, and then cover it with a kind of spherical coat of protein. So in this case, the capsid proteins form a kind of sphere, which is hollow, and the genome gets packaged in the middle. Now, the way proteins can form a sphere, the simplest way is if you've got 60 copies of the same capsid protein. And in this case, you could have three copies of the protein make up one triangular face and 20 faces make up an icosahedron. So that's why this is called icosahedral symmetry. Okay, because in the simplest form, these spherical particles are formed of 60 copies of one protein and three copies make up one triangular face. Now, if you, there's a bit of a limit of the size of particles like this. It can only be, you know, 20 to 30 nanometers of di in diameter. So that means the genome has to be pretty small. However, if you want to get more 
DNA or RNA into an icosahedral capsid, you have to add some more proteins and have more and more complex, complex architecture. But whatever the architecture, you can still somehow, well, the people who do structural biology, they, they, they still realize that there's, there's basically this uh, kind of icosahedral structure because at some point there's always a pentamer up here which is at the kind of vertex of one of these triangular faces. Okay, so icosahedral capsid structure, the idea is you've got a proteins on the outside, they make up a hollow ball, and the DNA and the RNA goes inside. Um, yeah. So, what are the basic functions? So that's, that's the basics of virus architecture. And just like for bacteria or anything else in biology, you need to know something about the structure function relationship. So the capsid protein, basic function is to protect the nucleic acid. And for naked viruses, non-enveloped viruses, the capsid proteins also mediate attachment and entry into the host cell. Now, for enveloped viruses, okay, so we've got some kind of protein around here, and then we've got the envelope. For enveloped viruses, the capsid protein is on the inside, right? So it can't interact with anything on the cell. So in order to be able to bind to a cell, every type of enveloped virus has got to have at least one kind of surface glycoprotein. And the function of this surface glycoprotein is to mediate the attachment and entry into the target cell. Now, many envelope viruses have got proteins in between the capsid and the envelope, which are called either matrix or tegument proteins. So these matrix proteins are often involved in maintaining the structural integrity of the particle. They kind of like join these two parts of the particle together. They can be involved in uh, budding of the envelope virus particle. And sometimes they can, uh, uh, these tegument proteins can uh, be released into the host cell before the virus expresses its genes. So here's two examples, a rhabdovirus. This is a rabies virus particle. So it's got a helical symmetry with an envelope. The envelope glycoprotein is the attachment protein. There's a nuclear capsid on the inside, and there's the matrix, which is just holding the thing together. Herpes viruses, they've got an icosahedral capsid here, envelope on the outside in blue, several different envelope glycoproteins on the outside. And in between, you've got this kind of mass which is several uh, tegument proteins. Okay, so, so far, this is the basics of virology. Uh, Filtrobody infectious agent, and then these diff parts of the Roth definition, uh, we should understand, you should understand the basic techniques for study, studying viruses and the basics of virus uh, structure. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you this question and see if uh, what answers we get. If I just open the question up, come on. Oh. Okay, now it should be open.
Okay, mostly. All right, so, yeah, question one, that's true. Yeah. All, all enveloped viruses must have at least one glycoprotein. This is also true. Basic function is to protect the genome. Two is false, okay? So most people got the right answer here. The thing is, it caps it pr are always proteins. So polypeptide, I should say. Well, wow. polypeptide is not exactly the same thing as a protein. Polysaccharide or polypeptide, this is capsule antigens in bacteria. This, lot of, uh, this comes up regularly as a mistake in the exams. Capsule, capsid, don't get mixed up, okay? Um, Viruses are not living organisms. About 50% of people say yes, 50% of people say no. Well, we'll talk about that one later, but this one, okay, number four. Non-enveloped viruses are more resistant to detergents than enveloped viruses. So most people say no. Well, what, somebody who says no, why, why did you choose that answer? This is not something I said in the, in the, uh, in the presentation, but you can work it out from your knowledge of biochemistry. So nobody chose this as the correct answer. So, so you think it's false, right? Why do you think this is false? Uh, because the envelope is made to also to protect. So if they didn't need that protection, they, didn't, they wouldn't have an envelope that would be the same thing. I'm not really sure I understand. So the thing is, and any other? <laughs> okay, nobody chose it, but okay. Uh, the envelope is made out of what? What's it made out of? Lipids, right? Detergent, what can this do to a lipid? You don't know? Yeah? yeah, it can destroy it and dissolve the lipid. It's like a washing up liquid. If you've got grease on your plate at home and you wash it up, it, the, the grease will be dissolved. So envelope viruses, when they're treated with a detergent, this will get rid of all the envelope, okay? Now you might say, yeah, but look, you've still got the capsid on the inside. So it's not the virus isn't destroyed. That's kind of true, but you doesn't have any envelope glycoprotein anymore. So this thing, if it's a non-envelope virus, it can't infect a cell anymore because it's lost the envelope glycoprotein and the function of the envelope glycoprotein is to attach to and infect the cell. However, a non-envelope virus, okay, naked virus particle, the capsid is made out of protein, it's resistant to detergent. So it won't be destroyed. And for a non-envelope virus, these capsid proteins are themselves responsible for infecting cells. So they will not be uh, inactivated by detergents. And that's very important because uh, you know, it determines what kind of control measures you have to use for a particular virus. So for influenza and uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, these are envelope viruses. So simple washing your hands with soap is enough to inactivate them or with a hydroalcoholic gel, it's enough. Uh, wiping down a surface with a simple detergent solution is enough to inactivate the viruses. But for non-envelope viruses, like for example, rotaviruses that cause uh, gastroenteritis, or um, you know, maybe uh, yeah, polio, polio virus, they're non-envelope viruses, that kind of treatment isn't enough to destroy them. So you need to use chemical agents which are much more uh, aggressive to destroy non-envelope viruses. And then generally speaking, more difficult to, to eliminate. Okay, last question, viruses are not living organisms. Someone who said, no, they're not living. Why, why, why aren't they living? Anybody? I, I think there's no like correct answer to this question.
So somebody who said no, why, why aren't they living? Cannot. Anyone else? Or is it the same thing? Okay, so they can't reproduce or grow on their own. Anybody who thinks, yeah, they're alive, these things? Because not everybody said this was true. So someone who thinks this is false, I guess you think viruses are alive? So if so, why should they be considered to be alive? Ah, <laughs> oh, no, okay. No really thinking about it. Well, the kind of answer that comes up, viruses are alive, might be, you might say, you know, they've got a kind of genetic material which is transmitted from one generation to another, so it's the same kind of thing as an organism. So I think you would say something to do with genetics. And someone who says viruses are not living would say, yeah, but you know, genetics, if they've got a genome and it's transmitted, you know, you could say the same thing as about, about a plasmid or a mobile genetic element, but you wouldn't say these things are alive, right? So a virus is kind of similar to that. Um, One of the kind of interesting things about this is that it's not really obvious what the answer is. So it's almost like there's a continuum between a real living organism and then some kind of part of uh, DNA that uh, favor, uh, favors its own replication. Okay, we've got about half an hour to do bacteriophage. Okay. So viruses alive, maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, bacteriophages. So these were, these are, this is a term for any virus that infects bacteria. And they were uh, first discovered independently by Frederick Twort in uh, England and by Felix Derrell, who was a Canadian microbiologist in 1917. So uh, Frederick Twort, apparently afterwards, after he did this, he was mobilized to go fight in the war and he never worked with bacteriophage uh, again. But Felix Derrell was uh, one of the people who really did the most to uh, you know, start the study of, of, of these, these types of viruses. And he set up this uh, assay called the plaque assay, which was very important because it meant that it was possible to quantify the number of infectious particles in a suspension. And historically, that was important because up until then, there was this kind of a debate about whether viruses are actually like cells, like some kind of particle, or whether it's just an infectious fluid. And so uh, the fact that you could actually get, dilute out a suspension of bacteriophage into something that will give you discrete points on some kind of cellular assay, this was interpreted as evidence to show that actually viruses and infectious are, 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 are particulate. That they, you have a suspension of viruses, you don't just have like a solution of uh, of uh, molecules, you've actually got some kind of particle in there. Now, uh, bacteriophage have been very important for studying, uh, you know, the fundamental processes of uh, molecular biology because this was the simplest system that was able to replicate its own DNA. So, things like the DNA is a genetic material, not protein. One of the key experiments were, came from bacteriophage infecting bacteria. The triplet nature of the genetic code, this was shown by experiments on mutants of bacteriophage to, to begin with. And more recently, in, for biotechnology, you have like very important tools like restriction enzymes and CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. They are all discovered in bacteriophage and 
bacterial defenses against bacteriophage. Okay, so they've been important historically. Now, in terms of their own biology, when you talk about bacteriophage, most people will visualize something like this, one of the tailed phages, the caudovirin, the kind of icosahedral head, uh, helical tail, and maybe some kind of platform at the base. And these caudovirin, the tailed phages, uh, are classified into like three main families, the myoviridae, the caudociphoviridae, and the podoviridae. So, Myoviridae have a, a characteristically long contractile tail. They look like this. And the, the examples are the T even phage, T4, T2, and so on. These are myoviridae. They are almost always lytic, but they can infect several different types of host. Now, Sifoviridae, like phage lambda, have got a long flexible tail, and they can often have a lysogenic cycle. That is, they don't always lyse the bacteria that they infect. Podoviridae, like the T odd phages, T7, T3, I believe, they've got a very, very short tail structure. It's almost just like one kind of like foot at one of the vertices of the capsid. They're always lytic, almost. And they have a narrow host range and only be able to infect one particular type or maybe one uh, strain of one species of bacterium. Now, that's what most people think of when you think about bacteriophage. And in fact, they're the most frequent types, okay? And they've all got double stranded DNA genomes, these guys. Now, these are the most frequent types of bacteriophage. But there are other kinds of bacteriophage around. So you've got bacteriophages which have a filamentous, non-enveloped uh, capsids like Inoviridae. You know, there are viruses that are icosahedric without a tail. And you've got a variety of enveloped bacteriophages. And some of them have really strange looking morphologies like this one. Gutavirus looks like a kind of droplet here with some kind of protein at one end of it. This thing here, Lipothrix virus, looks like a snake. I mean, look at the size of this thing, like a micron long here. And Fusello virus uh, looks like lemons or something. So uh, these viruses all uh, infect archaea living in uh, an extreme environment. So sulfur lobus lives in hot springs. So, you know, the, 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 the world of bacteriophage is a lot more diverse just than this, okay? If you ask somebody, draw me a bacteriophage, everyone will draw something like this, or at least I hope. But uh, in fact, the uh, phage world is, is more diverse than that. So we know a lot about the biology of these viruses, and we know a lot less about the molecular biology and the bi biology of these more... Uh, exotic bacteriophage. So thinking about diversity, it's kind of a bit difficult to, to conceptualize because, you know, a lot of bacteriophage have been identified that infect Escherichia coli, just one single species of bacterium. So you can easily have like about, I don't know, 10 different species of bacteriophage infecting one species of bacterium. And if you look, you can find bacteriophage that infect all types of bacteria. There are bacteriophage that infect gram positives, gram negatives, mycobacteria, and archaebacteria. Now, how many types of bacteriophage are there? And how many, you know, in, in, in the world? That, that's not really known. And it's, not so easy to measure. So I think there are only something like 20 or 30,000 named species of bacteria that can be grown and studied. But studies of DNA diversity in uh, soil or, or uh, marine environments have shown that microbial diversity is way bigger than that. 
So the, the estimates for the number of different bacterial species in the world, they're way bigger than the 30,000 species that have been uh, identified. There's probably, you know, two, three, maybe 10, maybe 30 million different species of bacteria on the planet. And you've probably got at least as many or 10 times as many species of bacteriophage. Okay, so there's a lot of that genetic diversity in bacteriophage genomes. Uh, another thing to think about is, you know, how many phage have we got on the planet? Okay, because if, if, you, if you look for them, you find them pretty much everywhere. So how many are there? Now, uh, so this is kind of like audience participation part, but I think we'll just do this as a show of hands, if everybody is okay with that. So think about one ml of, of seawater. How many phage do you think you've got in like one ml of seawater down at the beach? Okay, so who says one? Hands up. Who says 100? Who says 10,000? One or two. Who says a million? Most Who says a hundred million? Okay, a few people. So if you go down at the beach, like a pornic or something like that, on a coastal environment, it'll be more like a hundred million per ml. But down out in the deep seawater, which is most of the volume of the ocean, you probably have a million per ml. Okay, so if you like uh, uh, go and swallow, uh, you see, you know, if you were uh, end up choking while you're swimming in the sea and swallow a bit of seawater, you've got a few hundred million bacteria phage you've just ingested probably. Okay, so that means how many are there going to be in all of the world's oceans? Okay, so you might have a, some kind of guess as to what the volume is in the complete world oceans. So if you just think that the average will be about 1 million per ml, what's the number going to be in the whole of the world's oceans? Okay, so who says 10 to the 10? Nobody, you're right. Who says 10 to the 20? Nobody. Who says 10 to the 30? One or two people. Who says 10 to the 40? Almost everybody. The correct answer is 10 to the 30 particles. Oh, this number is just incredibly huge, right? And it becomes very difficult with these powers of 10 to really envisage how big that is. So another way to try and like envisage the, the, the quantity here is to uh, think about, you know, how much carbon have I got in marine viruses? So if each particle contains about 0 0.2 femtograms of carbon, how much is that? So, so it's kind of easy, you could say, oh, it's a certain number of tons or kilograms. You could just multiply these two numbers up together. That would be a bit too easy. So the question is, that's equivalent to how many blue whales? Because you can visualize a blue whale, right? See how big that is. The idea is if you put all the bacteria fate together that are in the oceans, it's the equivalent of how many blue whales in carbon. Okay, everybody got this idea? Okay, who says it's one? One blue whale, right? massive. Who's, who says 100? One, who says 10,000? A couple more, who says a million? More people, who says 100 million? One person, you're the closest. The correct answer is 75 million, apparently. Okay, so th th that's a huge amount of carbon, okay? And if you line them all up, apparently this would be like uh, 10 million light years in length if you put them like one, again, one after the other. So there's really a huge amount of bacteriophage in the marine environment. And it's the second source of, or, or the second, uh, uh, I, I don't know, stock of organic carbon on organic nitrogen in the marine environment after bacteria. And because it's so, such a huge amount of carbon, then bacteriophage are really having an impact on the cycling of nutrients in the marine ecosystem. So in ecology, I don't know, I'm not really a big ecology person. I have a very, very simple and basic 
conception of ecology. So I don't know if you have this kind of thing. Primary producers are down here. So you've got like bacteria or something that are going to be fixing carbon dioxide and producing organic carbon. And then they're going to be eaten by something like this. This is the first consumers. This will be some other types of microorganism. They're going to be eaten by shrimps. And then these shrimps are going to be eaten by some kind of like fish. And then the fish are going to be eaten by a great white shark or something. So you've got this kind of idea of a pyramid where you've got the primary producers in the bottom and you've got the trophic levels where the organic carbon, organic nitrogen is going to be moved up to the, through these trophic levels. And then at the end, when these organisms die, they kind of get decomposed and the carbon and the organic nitrogen that they have is going to be recycled through, up through the trophic levels. So that's the kind of basic idea, but it doesn't include bacteriophage. So what's going to be the impact of bacteriophage? Well, it's going to be that a lot of these primary producers, cyanobacteria and the bacteria that are decomposing all the organic material from the dead larger animals, these bacteria will be infected by phage and then they'll be lysed and their contents will be released. So in fact, not all of this organic carbon or organic nitrogen that is present in bacteria will be available to be mobilized by these higher trophic levels. There's going to be a lot of it which is going to be shuttling in between bacteria because the phage will infect some bacteria, lyse them, and that will release organic carbon for some other bacterium to use. Okay? So the overall effect of all of these bacteriophage in the environment is that there's going to be a lot of organic carbon that stays at these lower trophic levels and doesn't actually become available for larger organisms. So understanding the interaction between bacteria phage and the impact they have on bacterial populations is kind of a bit of an unknown uh, quantity at the moment. But because there's so much carbon, so much organic nitrogen stored in bacteriophage, they, 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 they do play an important role. Okay, so maybe one thing we need to do before we stop is start thinking about fundamentals of bacteriophage replication. And this goes all the way back to the 1930s with classical, huge, fantastic classical experiment from uh, Ellis and Delbruck. And what they wanted to do was to study the growth curve of a bacteriophage. Like in the lab class, we study the growth curve of bacteria. You inoculate a culture of bacterium, and then you follow how many bacteria you have at different time points. So they were doing exactly the same thing with bacteriophage. So they got some kind of bacteriophage. Now, in order for bacteriophage to grow, you can't put it in LB medium. You have to put it into a culture with bacteria. So you infect the bacteria with the phage, and then you take samples out at different times, and you titer how many phage do I have at different time points. And once they did this, they got these kind of uh, uh, graphs. So this is the time. And this is the number of uh, plaques that they got with their plaque assay on a log scale. So what they found, and this was a very reproducible uh, experiment, you've got a lag phase for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. The numbers don't go up. And then you've got a very, very rapid release phase, and then you've got a kind of plateau. So you've just got three phases in the growth curve for bacteriophage. Uh, latent phase, release, and then plateau phase. And this can tell you two things. It can tell you the, how long a replication cycle lasts for a phage. So it's the time between when you start the infection and when you get to the beginning of the plateau. That's it. That's the phage you've replicated. And it can also tell you how many phage are released from one infected bacterium. Because down here, at the, at the latent phase, 
This is telling you the number of infected bacteria you have. And at the top of the plateau, that's telling you the total number of phage you've had released. So if you divide this number by that number, it tells you how many phage get released from one infected bacteria. And this can be something like 100, 1,000, 10,000, something like that. So you begin beginning to get some kind of idea of how phage replicate. Now, in order to understand really how this works, you have to understand the plaque assay, okay? So the, 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 the plaque assay works like this, and it's almost the same thing as you did in the lab class to count the number of bacteria in a suspension. You start out by preparing tenfold dilution series, and then you inoculate these dilutions, not onto the agar plate, but onto a mix of bacteria in soft agar, and you pour that onto the plate. Then you put these, I think you should probably start drawing this out. So you pour these, you put these plates into the incubator, and then after a while, what you'll see is that where you've got a high dilution factor, there's no infectious phage anymore. So you just have the bacteria growing in a kind of uh, lawn. Then when you don't dilute the phage very much, all the bacteria get infected and they all get lysed. So you have a kind of like clear plate. And then at some kind of dilution, you'll get individual plaques that you can count. And one of these plaques corresponds to one infectious particle that you had in the sample. So what you can do to get the titer of your sample is you count the number of plaques, you multiply by the dilution factor, so this is 83 times 10 to the 3, that gives you 8.3 times 10 to the 4, but you only inoculated 0.1 ml, so you need another factor of 10. So this gives you 8.3 times 10 to the 5. And it's in plaque forming units per ml. So this is just the same kind of thing as for bacterial colonies. Bacteria, it's CFU per ml. Bacteria phage is PFU per ml. Now, one of the things is, okay, when you start this experiment, you've got purified bacteriophage at the beginning. But after a certain amount of time, okay, like 10 minutes after infection or something like that, you've got a mixture. You might have free bacteriophage and you have infected bacteria. So the question is, when you get a plaque on this assay, what does it really represent? Okay, and I've given you three options here. So you have to try and think about this. And another way to think about this is, you know, if you've got something like this, how many plaques will you get? Okay, here I've got four free bacteria phage, and I've got one infected bacterium with four phage in them inside it. So how many plaques will this give you? And that will get, tell you the answer to this question here, one, two, or three. And I think that's important for understanding the interpretation of this experiment. Okay, now I've started it up again. The question should be open.
Okay, not many answers. So I guess people don't understand the question very well. Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? Uh, okay, so. Okay, so if one is the correct answer, then that means if you've got something like this, how many play plaques will you get? Four, right? Because each one of these will give you a plaque and you're saying this would not give you anything. That's what one means, okay? Uh, two, this answer means one infectious phage in, in the culture or inside the bacterium. Well, that means this will give you eight, right? Because you've got four on the inside, four on the outside. So if two is correct, this would give you eight plaques on the, on, on, the, on, 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 the, on the plate. And if three is correct, how many would this get, that give you? Anybody? Uh, one in the culture medium or one infected bacteria. That would be five. Because each one of these would give you one, and this would give you one. Okay, so the number that you get from this kind of situation depends on the answer here. Okay, it's either four, eight, or five. <laughs> and in order to figure this out, you have to kind of visualize what is happening here. So when you put a mixture, say I've got like one infectious phage here. Right, and I've got one infected bacterium over here. It might have like 10 phage in there. When I spit, put this out on the soft agar, what is going to happen here? This is going to infect this cell. It can diffuse through the soft agar. It can infect a bacterium. What's going to happen here? This cell is going to be, it's going to be killed. It's going to be lice. It's going to release these phage. But because you've got the soft agar, all of these bacteria phage, they're just going to go and infect the cells nearby. So how many plaques will you see after the next day when you have this? Just one. Because no matter how many phage you have inside this bacterium, when it's put in there on the, on the, on the soft agar, they can't really go very far when they're released. Okay, They can just infect the nearby cells. It will just be the same as when you have one free bacteriophage. Okay, so the correct answer here is three. Okay, so when you spread this out on the plate, this will give one plaque, one plaque, one plaque, one plaque. This will give one plaque. Okay, because when this cell will ex explode, all these phage won't get very far. They, yeah. Yeah, when they're released, they can, they can infect different bacteria, but they can only infect the bacteria that are really next to them. Because once you've set the plate up, yeah, it, you, won't be, it won't, you won't be able to separate them anymore because they're so close together. It will just give you one plaque. It's like if you have like on a culture medium, if you've got like four bacteria that are stuck together on one like particle and you put that out on an agar plate, you just get one colony because they're growing so close together. They can't like get out and move freely around. Okay, so that's the answer to this question is that. So one plaque is one infectious virus particle or one infected bacterial cell. So once, Ellis and Delbruck had uh, understood this. Well, they, the, the initial model they had was, well, okay, what's happening here? I've got like the latent phase, the release phase, and then a plateau. So they thought, okay, what's happening is I've got the bacteria phage. It's getting into the, infecting the cell. And then once it's inside the cell, it's going to uh, replicate. And I have like a whole bunch of bacteria phage inside the bacterium. And then afterwards, they're released this bacterium is going to be lysed. So, but I've got the latent phase because even while it's growing inside the bacterium, here I just get the same, I get one plaque here and one plaque there. Okay, so during this phase, I don't see any growth, but that's because they're still inside one cell. 
And then when they, this bacterium gets uh, killed, it's going to release all of the bacteriophages that are inside in one kind of explosion. And that's why you get like nothing, 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 and then a huge increase. Now, that's the model. And what you need to do with the model is test it experimentally. And the way you can do this is exploit the fact that these bacteriophage are non-enveloped. They're resistant to detergents. They're resistant to um, solvents, organic solvents, whereas the bacteria that are infected are Escherichia coli. They are sensitive to alcohol, sensitive to solvents like chloroform. So what you can do is you can lyse the bacteria by chloroform that are in the mix of the infected cells and the particles. So if you've got something like this, you could lyse these cells and then you should be able to count the number of phages that are inside the bacteria because you can treat them, lyse the cells, but it doesn't inactivate the phage. And then you use this, then you do that. So this was what was done, big classical experiment. So that's the dotted line is what we saw before. The red, the solid line is what's called phage alone. That's after the chloroform treatment. And then this was the big surprise. The big surprise was that directly after infection, you have nothing. You don't have any infectious virus particles inside the bacteria. So that means that the model had to be changed. So what seemed to happen was that the bacteriophage disappears after it's infected the cell. So instead of having a cell with a bacteriophage inside, you've just got this thing, which is an infected cell. And then the infected cell produces bacteriophage because later on, during the latent phase, you can have formed infectious bacteriophage that are inside the bacterium here. And then further on, they're released. Okay, so that's pretty much a good place to stop. I'll just do this one slide because that experiment was very important in really the first step to understand how viruses, how bacteriophage replicate when they affect a cell. And it was breaking down the replication cycle into different steps. So the first one is attaching to the surface of the cell. The second one is entry, delivering the nucleic acid, the genome into the cell. Then you have what's called the eclipse phase. This is when you've got no infectious bacteria, bacteriophage or virus left. So the virus itself seems to disappear. Then later on, you get assembly, you get reappearance of bacteriophage and then release. And you can see these steps for some viruses by electron microscopy. So if you've got these, oh, it's not showing, why am I, what's going on here? Okay, so this is a chlorella virus, it's not a bacteriophage. So you can visualize the attachment and then you get the entry. So only the DNA will enter the infected cell. That's why you don't have an infectious virus anymore, because you've separated the DNA from the capsid and you need both of them together to have an infectious particle. And then during the eclipse phase, two things are happening. Replicating the virus genome, expressing the viral proteins, and then afterwards you begin to see new particles assembled inside the infected cells and then finally they build up and then they're released by lysing the host cell. So I guess I'll stop there and microbe of the week this evening and next last class on Wednesday.